Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to another edition of the B&H Virtual Event Space. Very happy to welcome to the event space, Dominique Hammer. Dominique, how are you today? Hi. Hello, everybody. I'm fine. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Well, today we're talking black and white photography with Dominique. That's his specialty, if you would. And I uh, want to thank you for being here, Dominique. I know I know by you, it's, it's nighttime, right? Yeah, right. It's uh, nine o'clock and... I'm used to it. It's fine for me. That's it. He's he's a he's a creature of the night. So he's he's joining us from from all the way in Austria. So we really appreciate him being here, and uh, we want to say thank you again. But a reminder to everybody: if you have any questions that you want to get over to Dominique related to black and white photography, please feel free to do so. If you're joining us here on Zoom, you can use the Q and A tab. If you're joining us on Vimeo or Facebook, you could use the comment section and we'll make sure to get them over to him. But I'm going to step out of the way and let Dominique take over. So thanks for being here. Thank you. Okay. Um, my name is Dominique. I'm from Austria, Vienna. And it's a small country in Europe. So I have a lot of stuff to tell you and I want to jump right into it. Let's go. Okay. My biggest steps with black and white photography and especially with black and white fashion photography. Now, <clears throat> the first thing I wanna talk about is eyesight. And I think this is one of the most underrated topics in photography, especially if, if you um, choose to photograph people. And uh, eyes, training eyesight means that you will uh, develop a good taste in photography. You will uh, develop um, uh, a good taste and, and you will consume really good photography and you will, uh, this is one of the biggest uh, uh, differences between uh, good photography and extraordinary photography is just a good taste in, in photography. So there are several ways to train your eyesight and the first one is follow photographers that you personally admire. Don't follow photographers from your local area or follow your friends or something like this. Think of the biggest photographers and the most extraordinary photographers ever and consume only their photography. So you can make sure that your eye is trained to only the best photography out there. And when you do this, you get used to it. You get used to really great photography and you will develop uh, a better taste in your own photography. So um, in my case, I'm, I started to follow, you know, Peter Lindbergh, um, Irving Penn, Patrick de Marchelli, Herbritz, Mario Testino, and just a few names. And um, this, this trained my eyes to becoming better in, 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 um, in uh, ex experience uh, photography better, in, in seeing, seeing better. And yes, Tra yeah, the training I said means developing a good taste. This is one of the biggest topics for me. Um, the most incredible photographers, only this, um, you should find out who is your hero. For me, I told you a few, but this might be different for you. So if you're more into color photography or if you're in architecture photography or nature photography, try to find your heroes and consume their art. Uh, the third uh, point, training your eyesight means analyzing photography. What makes a good, real good photography stand out? And I will try to help you to analyze photography the way I do it. So if you analyze pictures, photography, great photography, and you find out what makes them stand out, then you can take these techniques or uh, these, these, uh, what makes them special and use it for your photography. Uh, the third, third uh, thing to train your eyesight or probably to train your taste in photography is 
to find out how do they, the, these big photographers work? What can you learn from them? I know, for example, that um, Annie Leibovitz works with a big team, while Peter Lindbergh often only worked with the model and, for example, a hairstylist. And one, one photographer works only in the studio, the next photographer works only outdoor. Um, you, can, you can find out what works for you the best and, and find techniques they, they use. And if you analyze how they work, you can also get better, improve and find uh, your perfect way to work for you. Yes, the conclusion to training my eyesight was it, it changed the way uh, I take pictures drastically. I see different, I, I shoot different, I look different at photographies, I analyze it. When I see photography on the street or at uh, commercials or when I, see, when I look at magazines or at, I I analyze these pictures and it's different from what I used to look at pictures before I started training my eyesight. And I analyze how they use light. And the, the biggest thing, the biggest change it made over the years was also the pictures I choose from my shootings is, is a very, it's, it's a very different selection from what I used to choose when I started out as a photography. And when I look at, at, at pictures from like 10 years ago, they are pretty boring. And I wouldn't, I would, I would take different pictures and choose them from the same shooting from 10 years ago. So I trained my eyesight. I experienced um, big photographers and it, it made me, it, 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 it changed me, it changed uh, the way I, I analyze pictures and it also changed my taste. So I would, even uh, I would even choose different pictures that I made 10 years ago. Okay, let's um, jump to the next. Let's, let's analyze these two pictures. I made, I made these two pictures. Um, about a half year ago, uh, the model is from Sweden. She was in Vienna, and this is uh, this is photography that I am I am doing this photography for one and a half year years. Um, I started with like every every fashion photographer. I started with a big team with hairstylists, with makeup artists with one or two models, with a fashion designer, with an assistant in a big studio. And I found out for myself that it does not take so much to create uh, really cool photographs. So this session was just me and the model. And I developed this, this style um, in black and white because um, you don't need a makeup artist Black and white um, is more forgiving, forgiveful. With the skin retouching, it's it's pretty easier. You don't see every wrinkle, every pimple, and so I started creating black and white photography with only the model and a very very classic style of clothes, of hair, make almost no makeup, probably very natural, and started creating a very easy, very limited, minimal photography. So it was just a black or a white backdrop. One camera, one lens, one light, one model. That's it. In my case, if I would analyze this picture, the first thing that uh, comes to my mind is, where is the main light? The main light is on the le left above, above the model. It's only one light and you can see from the shadow under the chin that it's a soft light, it's a soft box. It's no harsh light, no harsh shadow. Um, so it must be a big, big soft box. I knew it because I have, I've been there in the shooting. So these two pictures uh, fit together very perfect. 
um, I wouldn't, in my early days, I wouldn't have chosen the right picture because I used to choose a picture where the model looks into the camera. This is something that, for example, has changed when I developed my taste, when I consumed uh, really cool photography. Um, I do, I do, uh, I do, I choose different pictures and I also try to find pictures that fit to each other. Like you would put it in a magazine. Um, yes. The, the picture on the left is, if I analyze it, the first thing that comes to my mind is the light. And the second thing that comes to my mind is the pose. The pose is very classy. It's very model-like. Um, also, the, the, the expression on the face is a bit arrogant. What I personally like a lot with models is something that you would see in a magazine, for example. And the third thing that comes to my mind is the simplicity of this whole scene because it's, it's a black jacket, it's a black backdrop, it's just one light, just the model, just the expression. And the composition, of course, with, uh, that comes from the pose and the composition of the two pictures that harmon have, have a harmony. So it's very classic. That, that's how I would describe my style. My black and white photography style is very classic, very, um, it's, uh, it's like it comes from the, from the 70s, 80s, 90s with all those classic role models like Claudia Schiffer and Naomi Campbell and Kate Moss and that stuff. So this is where my personal taste goes to. And this is the photography that I consume and that I, the style I want to create for myself. Okay, analyzing these pictures. Um, let's make a short summary. The light, only one light from uh, left above, only one backdrop, black, uh, only one outfit, just a jacket and uh, you can see the pants, of course she had pants on, and it's wet hair, which is also classical style for black and white fashion photography. Wet hair always, always works really cool. Almost no makeup, and we used a skin moisturizer that makes the skin a bit more glow. And that's it, a bit of retouching. Okay, how to analyze photography is, it means to me to ask the right questions for uh, analyzing pictures. So, yeah, it, it's, it's a bit of a joke from, from the pro photographers. The beginners ask, what camera did you use? The enthusiasts ask, which lens did you use? And the professional asks, which light did you use? So from my experience in the studio, black and white photography, the camera doesn't matter really. It's, uh, you can use Canon, you can use Sony, you can use Fuji, you can use Panasonic, you can use Nikon whatever camera you have, you can use it. You can also use it with the kit lens because studio photography with like I do it is always f-stop eight, uh, 160 uh, with the shutter speed and the light is the absolute essential in the studio to me. So that's why the pros always ask in the studio, what light did you use? So was it, a big, big strobe. Was it? A, uh, was it an LED light? Was it a uh, big softbox? Was it beauty dish? How many lights did you use? So this is the question I would ask with the studio photography. Yes, the hard soft light. You can you can easily find out which which light was used uh, if you take a look at the shadow at the transition of the shadows. Um, if the transition of the shadows is, is more harder, then it, it will be probably a reflector or a beauty dish. If there is a, a soft transition from the shadow to the light, then it's probably a soft box. 
and you have if you have a lot of light and you only you have the feeling it's only one light then it's probably a big softbox and if you, if you can find highlights on the other side then it's probably a second light from from the back so this is how i would analyze photography and i would try to find out what makes this photography stand out what 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 was the light all about so that's probably the essential of studio photography is always what was the light what what did they do with the light okay jump to the next one yes your position uh this is something uh, that that isn't isn't that obvious um sometimes it's shot from above sometimes it's eye level sometimes it's shot from below and i have a example for you uh, that is not so obvious but obvious for me and I, I can show you what i'm talking about yeah learning how great photography was made is is probably essential in in getting better for you for your personal photography for your black and white photography so it opens uh, your horizon for for new techniques for probably new angles have you ever shot from above or shot shot from below or uh, have you you can try out new light setups if you if you know how to analyze photography and then you can you reproduce them that's uh, this is why it's so important for me to analyze pictures and to find out how they did it and what 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 makes is the pictures a sense Yes, this, this is the example I was talking about. Um, both pictures are shot a little bit from uh, below. It's a rather, it's a wide angle lens a bit. I think it's probably some, somewhere between 20, 28 and 35 millimeters. And I shot it from below because I wanted to let the model look more majestic, more uh, a bit of, a bit bigger um, and I, I stre also stretch it also stretches the image it stretches the legs it makes the pose look different than for example if you would have used a 50 millimeter or 70 millimeters and I try this out uh, I, I usually shoot with a zoom lens with a 24 to 70 millimeter so just tried it on the studio really liked it and I shot probably the whole series wide angle and from below. So this was kind of a style I created on the go. <clears throat> um, analyzing these pictures. So the, the light is again from the left side. It's a left side and above because you can see the, the shadow under the chin. So it must be coming from above. Um, also, it's a very big light because um, there is only one light and the whole model is, is covered in light. So there is no darker area. So it's, it's a real big softbox or probably two. I think it was two actually. Um, the next thing is the expression. I really like the expression on, on, the, on the, the right picture. I think this is what makes the, the picture more special than other pictures. And I really liked the pose and the composing on the first picture on the, the left one. And because it, it looks like a triangle and it, I think it was on the cover of a smaller magazine. That's why I, I kept the, the space above the model. So you can, you can insert the, um, the title. The expression, a pose. What's what's again extraordinary on this? The shooting is again styled very classic with the jacket, uh, the pants, and the coat, of course. High heels. The position of the camera is a bit special here. I told you so. It's a shot from above and with a wide angle lens. So that was something different. Um, I, I tried out and I really liked it. And these are things that you can discover if you if you consume uh, photography. So I have, I'm pretty sure I have seen this somewhere uh, and tried it out because 
some some of my heroes like Peter Lindbergh or uh, Mario Testino did it and I thought oh I have to I have to try this out okay let's try wide angle lens shot from above looks great with him let's try it out and looked great with me yes the styling uh, I think actually the model did the styling herself and it I think it was her idea to put the hair into um, into the shirt, yes. Pretty nice style elements. Okay, one one of the major things uh, that probably makes professional photographers uh, uh, that that makes uh, pro uh, professional photographers do different things to prepare a shooting. Um, the first thing is you you choose your team wisely. I think the, the first thing when I start out as a photographer that I would tell myself, my younger ten year, um, my younger self uh, ten years ago, I would have told, get the best team you can to work with you, because um, then then you have just do your to do your job, and if there are great people involved. There is more creativity involved. There is more ideas. There is more um, quality. If you get the best people to work with you, you don't have to change yourself. You just have to be yourself. But the other people will bring ideas that you probably never have thought of, and that makes that can make a a pretty average sh photo shooting make extraordinary. You can create extraordinary pictures with the right people around you. Um, yeah, more people means more creativity. Uh, if you have a big team, it's the, uh, very important to give uh, a general creative direction. I always create a mood board. I always give uh, the, 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 again, the general direction for the whole team. And I always let enough space for ideas. It's not too strict, it's just um, just a, a direction that I want to go in. I would that I would uh, would want the shooting to look, but it's not strict. yeah if if someone comes up with a different idea and I think it's great, then we would, would like we do it anyway. So I always create my mood boards in Pinterest. I think that's a, a great platform to do this. I all I have uh, uh, a lot of Pinterest mood boards. I have one for posings. I have one for classic black and white. I have for uh, different shooting styles. I have mood boards, and I always create a new one if there is a special idea, and I send it to the whole team, and we can work on this. So everybody knows where the shooting is going, where the uh, where the direction is and they can bring in their ideas. They come prepared to your shooting. And also you can send the mood board, for example, to model agencies, if you're looking for models. And if they like the idea, then you will probably get better models or uh, probably models that you wouldn't have uh, gotten to work with you because they like the idea that you are about to create. Yeah, next next thing, very important for me because uh, technique is always an issue. Uh, prepare yourself. Check all your equipment the day before. Um, you can probably set up the whole studio thing, uh, check everything, get the batteries, get uh, the flashcards, uh, check the laptop. Um, and if you don't have a second camera and it's a big photo shooting, try to borrow a second one as a backup. Nothing is more, uh, nothing makes you more angry if, if your, your camera dies and the whole team is here and ready to go and you can't work. So I would probably have a second camera or borrow a second from a friend or somewhere else. As I told you in the studio, it's not that important uh, what the camera is. Just make sure you can work with it as a backup. Yes, 
uh, one of the biggest steps in in my uh, in my photography was when I started shooting tethered. That means that you connect the camera with the laptop, and you can immediately see uh, what you are shooting. The pictures they they come up uh, on the screen, and you can correct mistakes. You can check the light. You can show the pictures to the model you can work on the poses you can uh, you have you have a better overview on on the image language uh, on also the makeup artist and the hairstylist uh, they probably see small mistakes and they can correct them directly on the set um, this this was a, a big step forward for me when i started shooting tethered I immediately could correct any mistakes that I wouldn't have seen on the small camera screen. So this is this is one of the biggest issues for me is I always shoot with a laptop and the whole team immediately sees what we are doing and what it will look like. Also, I have my, my presets directly set on the pictures. So they see the pictures directly in black and white. And uh, you also see if the makeup works, if the hair works, if the outfits work, if there is enough light, or if you have to change, if you have to change something, you can do it directly, and it's not too late. Yes, and as I told you, I started to work with only one model. I have really small teams. Sometimes I have a makeup artist, but usually I only work with one model me one light one background one camera and one of the biggest uh, steps forward was when some some big photographer that uh, i was at the workshop told everybody that the photographer is not the most important person on set actually sometimes he's the least important person because first comes the model course because you can't capture what isn't there so the model is probably the most important person on set um, and then then comes the stylist and the makeup artist and the whole team they create the thing and you just have to capture it so and when when i thought of okay i'm i'm not important i just have to be myself and let the team be creative and just capture what is there and that this was a major step forward. So there is a lot of uh, weight on the shoulders disappeared. So I'm I'm not that important. I have, I just have to to do my my thing, and probably get better models. And uh, they they will improve the pictures. It's easy, sounds easy, but you have to get them. Yes, that's the conclusion. Ah, let's jump to the next one. Okay, um, black and white photography, and there I used two different techniques with these two pictures. They are more extravagant than my usual studio photography. Uh, the picture on the left is shot on set, and it's uh, very famous place in Vienna is called the Schloss Schönbrunn. Uh, and I got this, this model, Matthew from Australia actually, and he came with the skateboard. We agreed to do a small, small fashion shooting with a suit and there was no idea of a skateboard involved. So I just, I, I saw him coming with the skateboard and I thought to myself, okay, let's let's do this with the skateboard. This is amazing. Um, so we did we did the whole shooting uh, with the skateboard, and this was the the perfect shot. And the the technique I used is a pan shot. So you go with the camera and you move with the model. And there was also one big strobe involved with the flat, with a big softbox. And this, this is why the background is, is blurry. There's some motion blur and you can create this with 
uh, a pen shot. Try, try it out, it's, it's a um, pretty cool uh, technique, but you have to practice this before you go to a shooting. I was used to it because I shot sports for a few years and it's a common technique in sports photography. So I used it for fashion photography, which is kind of different. It's a, it's a mix and liked it really. It worked really good with, with this shooting. Uh, the picture on the right was with the, a bigger team. Um, if I would analyze this picture, then again, I would uh, check where was the light. So the light was again on the left upper side. Uh, you can see it on, on, the, on the shadows, uh, on the chin again, and the shadows from the feet, they go from left to right. And what makes this picture a bit more special is it's a double exposure. So there is one picture, but the flash actually worked two times. Yeah. If you don't know what double exposure is, look it up. There are a lot of tutorials how to do it. Uh, I did it with a hack. Uh, I made a long time exposure, like 20 seconds, and I flashed two times with the, with the hand, and the model walked. So this is how you can create this, this look. Uh, bit different. And uh, I worked on this with a bigger team. It was actually was a designer. So this the, the, the clothes are from a designer, uh, the models from agency. Uh, we had a hairstylist and a makeup artist on the set. And when I showed them what I'm about to do with the double exposure, uh, they were pretty amazed. And I really loved it, really loved it. Yeah. Creating different, different techniques also. Um, what is what makes pictures more stand out? Um, yes, I have seen double exposure pictures from a very famous photographer from Austria. So again, I was consuming really cool photography and I thought, okay, I have to learn this technique and then I try it out. And I used it with fashion photography. Actually, it was not used by the photographer with fashion, rather with a portrait. Uh, but I thought of the idea making a move, making a move and, and double exposing it and having this ghost artifact, artifactal effect. Yes, um, I think the important thing on the right image was the team because uh, they did the styling, they did uh, also the makeup and the hairstyling. They, I were involved with the posing of the models. So they, let, they let the coat fly and that stuff. And the, the team came up with most of the ideas from styling and the set. And my idea was on, only the, the double exposer. And so we created this as a team. Yes, team was probably the most important thing on the, on the shooting. Also the pose on, on the right picture and on the left picture, what makes the picture stand out is, of course, the movement and, and the, uh, the thing that a guy in a suit is, is going with the skateboard in the city. And yes, both, both images um, are more extravagant. If you think of the technique, it's not that boring. It's, not, uh, it's, it's more movement in the picture. Uh, also a thing that you can learn or you can try out and, and bring into your photography. Uh, both pictures were not planned in black and white. I shot them in color actually, but thought uh, uh, I should try it out in black and white and I changed it later to black and white. Yes. Yeah, the, the st styling on the, on the right picture is also a bit more extravagant because guys with makeup are not that usual. Okay, so something uh, that I really like to talk of is finding the essentials in, in, in photography. And with the essentials, I mean technical stuff. So I used to have a lot of camera systems, five different, five different systems with cameras, uh, with, with, with lenses, with I had a Leica system, I had a Fuji system, I used to shoot Canon, uh, shot with Sony, uh, 
I shot with a Hasselblad, shot with a film system. And one day I, I, I thought, okay, um, I'm thinking the whole time of the photo shooting, I'm thinking of what lens could I use or probably I should switch to this camera or that camera. And it distracted me from the thing I should do during the photo shooting, which is working with the model and creating pictures. And then I thought, okay, let's break this down. Let's get it as simple as possible. Uh, I shoot with one camera, one lens, one light, one background, and I focus on image language, on composition, on the posing of the model. I uh, usually talk a lot with the models, uh, which poses work, which does not work. We can see it on the laptop. And <clears throat> I rather work with the person and the technique is something that just should be there and work and not distract you from creating uh, pictures. So something I tried out and I stayed with it. Uh, one day I just thought, okay, let's, uh, let's use just, just one, one camera, one light, one lens, one background, and let's see where it goes. And it worked so well for me that I thought, okay, I stay with this. As long as there is no need to, to change the lens, I don't change. As long as there is no need to change light or bring in a second light or change the background, I don't change it. I work with the thing I have and rather try to create the pictures with the model and uh, work with the person in front of the camera. That's, uh, this is something. So I stay focused and I rather uh, increased the quality of pictures because I did not think of the techniques of the technical stuff. It just has to work and it just, it's not distracting me. Yes. Uh, so uh, something that I would, a tip that I would use, I would, I would give to every beginner is start with one light. Uh, if you if you rather like soft light, uh, get uh, get one soft box. If you like harder light, get one reflector and use this only. Start with one light and use it and shoot with it probably for one year, two year, as long as you don't have the feeling to that you need a second one, a third one, don't buy it. Just stay with the one and try to get perfect shots with only one light. And often there is no need to, to bring in more. If you have the feeling that um, something is missing, you know, you rather would, would like to have or two or three lights or different backgrounds or go out, uh, then you know, uh, then, you, then you sure can do it. But I would recommend that you start with the absolute minimum and you work with it and try to rather create great pictures with the most simple settings that you can think of. It also can be natural light, of course. Um, you can try out which how different um, daytimes affect the image because there is harder light uh, during lunch and there is soft light um, if it's cloudy or soft light also if uh, at sundown. And you can use uh, the light that is, that's there. And it's, it's just the light is, is different and you have to find out which you like more or you can of course use both. And uh, both, li both lights have advantages and disadvantages, you know, like if, if you shoot it, uh, if you shoot at uh, sundown, you probably have light for one hour, but I really like the light. It's softer, it's from the side, it's, it's, you can create uh, effects with the light behind the models and that stuff. Try it out. <clears throat> um, one, one, one positive aspect of using lesser equipment is of course, you have lesser sources of error and you don't carry around a lot of gear. So if I go out and, and I shoot, I, I don't shoot with flash, 
uh, then it's just one camera, one lens, one battery, and one flash card. And that's it. So uh, I have a really small bag and I can go out and shoot for two hours and create amazing stuff without um, having back pain. <laughs> uh, great stuff. Um, something I discovered over the years uh, that you have to find out what, what works for you the best and the newest lens will probably not improve your style of photography. It's rather more knowledge and uh, rather repeating, creating photography and don't buy new stuff. I, I, would, I would just buy new stuff if someone something dies of your old stuff or if you really have a lack of, of a technical, uh, a lack of so, something is missing in your photography and you know, okay, uh, I really need this to create. So what, uh, what comes to my mind and yes. Yeah, let's, let's analyze a picture again. The light, this time the light comes from the right side, uh, probably not above, but eye level because the shadow on under the chin is, is not so visible. It's the light is uh, probably, it's, it's not, not, it's very, very much on this, on the side, not, not from the front. And I, I personally like this image a lot because the body is looking into one direction and the face is looking in the, in the other direction. And, on the same time, the hair is kind of falling perfect and it's a classic style with the jacket. And it makes the picture look like it's from another decade, like it's from, from the 80s or 90s. And so the in, uh, analyzing this image is, I think this image is all about the expression of the model and the pose of the model and the thing that she does with the body and the head on the different and the way she looks is, is a bit arrogant, a bit dreamy. And this, this is what makes the image stand out. The light isn't so special. Uh, the styling isn't so special. So it's, it's, it's only the model that, that created this picture. I was just there to capture it. Yes, the expression is everything that makes this image uh, shine. The classic styling and the position of the light is uh, on the right side. Th that's a big, that's a little summary. And that's the things that helped me the most. So the thing that helped me probably the most is that I only work with agency models. Agency models have, they bring in, um, they bring in a very high standard of posing very high standard of expression, a very high standard on clothes they can bring on, on styling they do with the hair with, and they also are very professional. They're on time. They create expressions that you don't see with like uh, the girls from next door, I would say. So, I stopped working with models from Instagram, I would say, and I exclusively work with agency models and I only very rarely uh, make exceptions. So this uh, improved my photography a lot. Yeah, training my eyesight, I, I told you about this. I consume only great photography don't consume photography from, from friends, from photographers around the area. I just look at the best people I could think of and I daily train my eyes. I just look at the best stuff I can find um, and inspire me. I shoot tethered. This is, again, the, one of the big steps I made forward. Shooting tethered have, helps so much improving your photography because you immediately see errors or things that don't work and you can correct them immediately and uh, probably get better pictures from the shooting. I always create a mood board and send it to everyone involved, yes. Um, 
send it to the model. Uh, you can also brainstorm, come up with ideas, and the mood board is your general direction that you can give to the team. If the team is only the model and you, uh, it's also very important to create the mood board so the model knows what we are doing. She brings the right clothes. She has the right styling. Uh, and you uh, you don't have to talk so much. And of course, uh, she knows what, uh, what you are expecting from her with uh, uh, the, the posing and the expressions. Yeah, so, something that I have to I have to talk about at least is I created my own preset and this was own, also a real big step forward. I did this through the first Corona lockdown, uh, sat down for a few days and I worked with Capture One, if you know the the uh, the program, uh, really really great. It's really great. It works really great for me. And I sat down and I worked on this preset and found my own style. And the thing with presets is um, you can buy presets, but uh, these presets don't work perfect with your photography because they are not uh, created with your photography. So I, I used one of my pictures and I worked on this picture with my studio setting with my flash set setting with my camera settings with my camera and the preset works exactly the way I want it to because it's based on my studio on my lights on my everything so if I would sell this preset it might look crappy for you because you are not using my studio settings and I think it's very important to create your own stuff and directly use your own style if you shoot tethered. So um, you get a glimpse of what it looks like, the final image. Uh, so when I shoot tethered, I always see the picture in black and white and I always see my almost final image and that helps me a lot in, in, in creating the perfect image and f finding what I was looking in, in the, in the um, ah, you, you see English is not my mother language. Um, yeah. Um, I lost the things. <laughs> Yeah, uh, long story short, it, the bought, a, a bought preset is not, is not your ultimate solution. So it's, you should create your own, your own preset because then it's yours, it's your style, it's, your, it's, it's not something that some other person can buy and use it. And so you have your own, your own style, your own thing that nobody else can use. And uh, this is why everyone should create their own their own presets so it's uh, my preset for example is very flexible it does a lot with the skin tones but it does mm, nothing with with kind of uh, contrasts and lighting and that stuff it's just the way colors are transisted into black and white this is what my preset does but it's it's not probably works not for everybody so try to get your own sit down think of the style you want to create use your own pictures that's probably the major part use your own picture and create the the, the style or the preset on your picture because then it will fit to your style and for your workshop okay i see we are close to come to an end this is the last picture i will i will analyze with you a very professional model uh, he did the styling himself. He came up with the idea to pull the shirt uh, over the chin. He did the hair styling for himself. And I was just there to capture it. This is why I love to shoot with uh, professional models. Yeah, the benefits of agency models, professional models, is the expression. This image lives a lot of the expression, the, the look and the posing and the styling. And this, 
this the model did all of this. So working with the right people helps you a lot of getting better images of getting better. The styling and the clothes, of course, and they have a very high standard on body and skin care also. And that's, that's something I didn't talk about, but uh, the agency models are used to are used to this whole working process and whole settings and they are used to professional photo shootings and if you work with them you get the most professional surroundings and you can concentrate on shooting and capturing just capturing and you get better without getting better <laughs> yeah Okay, this is what I use a Canon 5D for 25, 24 millimeter to 70 millimeter. It's 90% of the time I use this. I sometimes use a medium format camera with a vintage lens, only very rarely. And Capture One is my main raw converter. Uh, I use a Ellingrom 500 watt strobe with a big Octo softbox and Photoshop for skin retouching. Yes, I think I'm done. That's it. Finished. 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 Now, now, now that we've been put out of business because Dominique told everybody not to buy anything. Yes, yes. <laughs> so, no, I, I actually, actually, um, I bought a lot of presets and none of them helped me out. And only when I made my own, I, I started to to. Yeah, I, I, I had my own style and then everything evolved. Yes. No, I think, I mean, you know, all, all jokes aside, obviously, you know, people, if you've ever wondered whether or not these are paid endorsements, obviously Dominique has just, you know, put a nail in that coffin. These are not paid endorsements. He's literally told you to, to get the least amount of equipment possible. But I love that idea because I think that there are people if you go out on Instagram or whatever social media website you want to go on to and, you know, spend hours upon hours of just <laughs> aimless scrolling, there's always somebody there. It feels like selling something, you know, there's always, especially when it comes to, if you're in our realm, the photography realm, there's, there's some photographer out there who's being endorsed by somebody who's being sponsored by somebody who's saying, you need to buy this. You need to buy my preset. It's going to work amazing for you. You know, if you don't have these lights and you don't have seven of them, you can't shoot like me. And so it's nice to see somebody come on here and say, hang on, you can, you can have one camera, one lens, develop your own style, figure that out and still be still be doing okay i love that message yes i think i think i mean when when i started with photography i i spent a lot of cash in camera equipment a lot of really really a lot of cash in, in and i sold almost everything and so over the years i thought okay i just need one camera i just need one probably two lenses okay i use outdoor i use a different lens than in the studio because in the studio it's f8 and in, in outdoors i use rather uh, i shoot wide open okay that's a different story but i only i also use one flash in the studio most of the time and so i thought okay you don't have to have a lot of stuff around just work with what is there get better some people need a lot of stuff I, I know a photographer he shoots with um, i don't know like five or six different lights in the studio it looks amazing but that's not my style. You have to find out what's your style and rather find out your what's your style before you start buying stuff. You can also start buying stuff if you know that you really need this. That I think that that's the message that I would, wanted to bring to the people. No, I love it. I think it's a great message and I think it's it's wonderful. Hope I, I'm hoping that somebody takes that away and I hope somebody doesn't fall into the trap you and I have both fallen into because... I also have a ton of equipment. <laughs> uh, you have been there. <laughs> I have I have been there. I continue to be there. I, I work at B&H. How can I not, right? There's always something. It's totally, it's totally okay to buy stuff. I also, I, I, I'm also buying stuff, but uh, very reduced 
And if I buy stuff, I really love to use it. That's, I think that's the message. You can sure spend like uh, 10,000 bucks on a Leica equipment, which is amazing. I have a Leica. It's really great to use, but I use it. That's, that's, that's the story. If you buy it, then you really have to use it. Just don't buy it because it's cool or you feel you need it. Don't, don't let it collect dust like, like all of the rest. Of yes. The yes. <laughs> I wanted to, I wanted to touch on something, you know, you said, you said, uh, that with, with models, you tend to use agency models versus using an amateur model or somebody, you know, yes. Instagram. for people who are just getting started, you know, not everybody happens to be personable and not everybody, you know, feels very comfortable in the beginning talking to people and connecting with people, you know, they might have a great vision and they might be passionate about, you know, capturing portraits, headshots, things like that. You know, what kind of advice can you share for somebody like that in terms of how to break down that sort of barrier with the model to make them feel comfortable and to make sure you're getting the shot you want and that they're going to be happy with? I think it's totally okay to, if you really start out to use your friends, sure. Uh, try to get someone that you are personally comfortable with and someone who is comfortable with you. And if you're just getting used to how the camera works and how the light works, and if you just want to try something out, like for example, you're shooting the first time in a studio, of course, get a friend. But if you're getting better and better and you feel, okay, I'm ready for the next step, then probably it's not about you. It's probably about the person in front of the camera. And this was something I didn't discover for years. I was shooting uh, a lot of amateur models, a lot of models I knew, but they are, haven't been agency models. And then one of the agencies asked me to shoot one of their models. And I said, hell yes. And there was a big step of quality forward. So I think it's totally okay to start out with someone uh, that you know is not a problem, but there comes, the, there comes the point for you, for your personal development, where you think, okay, what is the next step? And I think that is the next step. Yes, this is the step from the beginner or the enthusiasts to the professional. Yes, I think, and I, I, I didn't, I, I haven't knew it, until it happened and i was lucky to get one of one of the better models of this agency and so it was even more obvious what my problem was my problem was only that i was shooting not professional people in front of the camera while i was kind of getting professional got it Awesome. Well, Dominique, I want to, I want to say thanks again for being here. I know it's super late by you and I know you're, you, and you, said you were, you said you were a night owl, but I'm sure you're still tired. You still, I'm sure you still have work to do, you know, photographs to edit that kind of thing. So okay. I just, I just want to say thanks for being here. I want to say thank you to everybody at home for tuning in. I hope you picked something up. Um, if at the very least less is sometimes more, you don't always need to go out and purchase everything. Although you can, and we've got a spot you could do it. Be in any photo, more than happy. We're here to support you if you want to buy stuff. But that is a great message. I love it. I think great. that's important sometimes to get back, get back to basics and sort of break it down, and you know, embrace what you've got and figure out how to create with it. So wonderful message, wonderful photos. Thank you for sharing them and sharing your process. We really appreciate it. And thank you to everybody at home for tuning in as always. But that's all the time we have for now. Actually, one last thing, Dominique, I forgot. Where, where can people find you? How can people find you if they want to catch up with you, see more of your work? Uh, I, have, I haven't shown my last um, slide. My last slide. I, I can, we can, we can just share it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We want so, people to be able to find you. Yes. And this, this is where, we, oh. where, where you can find me. Yes. It's just my name.com or my name on Instagram. Of course, you can send me questions. I will answer them. Just awesome. connect with me. Awesome. I love it. Well, thanks again, Dominique, and thanks to everybody at home. This has been another edition of the B&H Virtual Event Space. We'll catch you next time. Great. Bye-bye.